so I'm Rob Hopkins from the Transition Together team and from Transition Network. So together, Transition Together is the emergent transition hub for England and Wales, and we're thrilled to be putting on this amazing summit. And in a moment, I'll be handing you over to your host for this evening, the fabulous Rob Shorter from the Donut Economics Action Lab. But before that, just a few tiny bits of housekeeping. So this session will be recorded. So do feel free to turn your cameras off if you wish. Uh, please make sure you stay on mute so that we can hear all of our wonderful speakers. And I hope that many of you have now joined Vive, our new online space, which if you can use Facebook, this is so much easier and so much less repugnant than Facebook, uh, where summit participants can connect, keep the conversation going and share some reflections. It'd be great if you use the same name on Zoom and on the platform so that you can find each other easily. The Vive link is going into the chat now. And if you've not yet joined, it's dead easy to do so and do have a look. So please also do amplify and share on social media using hashtags, which we're just popping into the chat for you all as well. And before we start, just a quick introduction to the people who are behind the scenes who are making this uh, happen. So Dan is our event manager tonight. Dan, say hello. Hello. And Rich is doing tech support this evening. Rich, introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Fantastic to see you here. And we have Chris doing the comms and the Twitter and all that. Chris, say hi. Hi. And also, like last night, those of you who were here last night, this tonight's session is going to be documented by the brilliant Fanny Dudu from Sketch the Move, who is going to create a beautiful graphic recording of this evening, which she will share with us at the end. And you can already find the one from yesterday on, uh, on the Vive platform. Fanny, say hello. Hi. So if you have any technical issues, uh, our tech team will be here monitoring the chat, so feel free to message them with any relevant questions, any requests or issues you're having. So thank you. And without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to your host for this evening, Rob Shorter from the Donut Economics Action Lab. Rob, over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Rob. It always feels funny, what one Rob handing to another, but I, I think it works okay. We, we've got through that bit. Um, hello and uh, welcome and thank you for joining tonight to discuss uh, how we can together put the ideas of donor economics into practice. Uh, it's a juicy question and it's one that I'm delighted to explore from the community perspective because many people are approaching the ideas of donor economics from policymakers to businesses to educators uh, and, and many between. And so we've got a fabulous lineup of uh, speakers today from people who are putting these ideas into practice uh, in the UK and abroad. And we hope to offer you some of these stories to offer these multiple perspectives on what it means to apply these ideas from the networking perspective, from the sort of the neighborhood perspective, and what it means to also position these ideas in a way that appeals across the political spectrum, the naming and framing of, of how we use uh, these ideas for transformation, because the framing of donut economics, let's admit it, it's not particularly usual. Adding the word donut to the word economics, it's an odd combination. And we love that. We think it's uh, an, a, an invitation to take the ideas of economics out of the minds of the privileged few who've explored them at an academic level and actually put it into the hands of everyone so we can all reimagine the economic future we want. So to literally put the ideas into your hands, the way we're going to start is slightly unconventional. I'd love you to have a look around you, look nearby where you are. Is there something that is donut shaped around you? might be in another room, but in the next 60 seconds, I invite you to hop up, grab that item and hold it up to the camera. So we're gonna create a gallery of donut shaped objects in our hands. So I'm gonna set this, the timer now. And so away you go. And now I've obviously got the advantage because one's right here next to me already. Um, but let's, uh, oh, we've got a, a, a pot from the kitchen already up on screen. I can see a candle. I can see, oh, Rob, very good. We've got vinyl economics already appearing. We've got uh, kitchenware economics and a water bottle and a lovely bracelet. Headphones. This is great. A lovely pot there. So give a few more people um, a chance to, to get their object. And as you are holding your object up, if you found it, 
you can scroll through the gallery and see what other people are holding up to. I love there's a is that a bagel, Steve? Is that a it's it looks like a it's definitely a baked good. So you're you're in the same genre there. We're steering wheel and a CD. So that's more than one in seller tape. Ah, oh, this is fantastic. There's something there that's coiled together, Alexandra. I can't quite see what that is, but that's brilliant. Um, few seller tapes and a mug. Let's hope we're not all mugs looking like this, but uh, this is great. So the idea is, okay, I think that's just been a minute. So if you haven't yet, just have a little scroll through and see what the other people are. Oh, I haven't even done mine. How bad is that? Here we go. Here's my, here's my pot with a literal hole in the middle. So you may put it down if you wish. But, I mean, feel free to hold it for the rest of the evening if you want. But um, I'm just going to hold this uh, shape here and explain to you why the idea of the donut is so powerful, why it's the idea that has convened so many people around uh, sort of this, this shape. And if we look at these two circles, it's really quite simple. We've got, a, we've got people who need to meet their essential needs. That's the circle in the middle. We've got a delicately balanced living planet that we mustn't overshoot the pressure on these life supporting systems. And we've got a problem. People aren't meeting their needs. We're putting too much pressure on the planet and we need to get into the space of the donut. It's that simple, the space where the sprinkles are. And so it's an idea that can be explained so simply, so intuitively that everyone can be a part of this question together. So when the donut was published in 2011, people started thinking, how can I apply this global goal of the donut to my place? How can we recognize this enormous challenge of meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet and recognize that our place, whether it be a neighborhood, a city, a district, a region, a nation, what can we do? What's our role in contributing to this challenge? And so in 2019, uh, we created the uh, organization Donor Economics Action Lab to support the people who wanted to explore this question. Anyone who, want, anyone who wanted to put the ideas of donor economics into practice. So as I mentioned today, we're gonna to be hearing some, from four of these fabulous people who are exploring this idea in their place. From the neighborhood perspective, we're gonna be hearing from uh, Daniel uh, Blyden and Kavita Purohit, who are exploring the ideas in um, Birmingham, in, in the community of Ladywell, uh, exploring all kinds of playful ways of, of opening up these powerful conversations. We're gonna be hearing from uh, Barbara Goffin, who works with an organization, Confluence, uh, on the Brussels Donut Project, and hearing about the way in which they've applied the ideas at many scales, and also understanding how they can position uh, this work to appeal across the political spectrum as they go into the, the, the next sort of more, more uh, maturing phase of their, their project. But first off, we're going to be hearing from Jane Brady. Jane Brady is the founding member of the Bioregional Learning Centre and co-convener of the Devon Donut Collective, a group of 160 people from all over Devon, working together in practical and imaginative ways to explore how citizens can more effectively look after their natural assets, regenerate regional systems for food, water, energy, waste, and enjoy life. Jane's background in design has helped bring creativity to the processes of creatively shaping and establishing the Devon Donut. So I'm delighted to now hand over to Jane to talk around the, the networking perspective of donut economics. Over to you, Jane. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, okay, I'm, I'm uh, a little overexcited. I will try to get through my slides. Um, I'm really here representing uh, a good 170 to 80 people now who are part of the Devon Donut Collective. Um, so I'll do my best to, to represent. Um, I'm now going to do the technical screen sharing business, see if I can get that sorted. Uh, how's that? Is that working? Yep, good, thank you. Yeah. Um, right, so here we go. Uh, 
again, representing the Devon Donut Collective. Um, <clears throat> so here is the Devon Donut on the right there. And uh, over the, not, not the past year, but from uh, 2020 to 21, the collective was uh, successful in creating what we call the first iteration People's Donut for Devon. And we did that, like I say, in about one year. So the, the goal um, really is such that the, the whole of Devon can see how we're faring ecologically and economically in the face of climate change and biodiversity loss. And we want to see that change across multiple uh, sheds, food shed, fiber shed, watershed, sectors and systems. And embedded in the Devon Donut is, this, is the space for revitalization. You can see that in the, the donut ring, the, the flesh colored donut ring um, that's part of our donut there. So not just um, looking at how badly we're doing, but really with a, with a sort of a positive outlook. If we're, if we're aiming towards revitalization, um, how can we create measures that take us towards that? <clears throat> so how did we do it? It's the next question going backwards there. So um, I've got sort of 10 points here. The, the first one is starting here. So uh, on the right there, you can see the, the bioregion of South, South Devon and the Bioregional Learning Center are conveners of the Devon Donut Collective. Um, so here in South Devon, we have areas that are urban and rural. We have sea and land. We have extremes of human poverty and natural beauty. Um, and that's, this is a space that the, that the Bioregional Learning Center has been working in for some time. So taking our learning um, of working at that scale, which is essentially how human societies have organized themselves for millennia, we invited what we call network nodes across Devon to participate in, in, a, in a donut economics experiment. Should I get this right? So, uh, Number, number two, in terms of how, how we did this, was to acknowledge that this work is part of a shared vision for place-based regeneration. So the, the donut framework, um, we think, is the, is the perfect container for seeing multiple examples of regenerative change in Devon. Um, and just to throw in an example here of some folks doing brilliant work, uh, Huxham's Cross Biodynamic Farm, you can see the, the ball of dry soil there. Um, in three years, they were able to transform that to the, the, the living soil that you can see on the right. And uh, we just think that's one of many examples uh, that are, are hugely inspiring um, and happening here in Devon. <laughs> Um, number three, we, we started really by asking some very open questions. Questions like, how healthy is Devon? How do, we, how do we know that? What do we need to measure? Would a donut be useful to people living and working here? And if so, how and to do what? Uh, and then what, what came from that was asking the question, which domains make sense for Devon? Maybe they're not the same as the original donut. Oh, I keep going backwards. So um, uh, we also set up an, a very enjoyable way of working. You know, over that year, we met online every Monday afternoon, essentially for what we called coffee and donuts, which was a drop in uh, session. And um, the, uh, Isabel and Nick and I created a, a kind of a loose framework that would provide guidance over that over that period. Um, in terms of discussion, we invited in experts. Um, and over that period, the, the group grew uh, from four to about 170, 180 donut makers. Um, over on the left there, we, we like to sort of test ourselves, check that we're still on track. So you can see that we asked the collective, um, would you like our regular donut, uh, regular coffee and donuts Zoom calls to continue? as we work forward and work with and utilize the Devon Donut. And we got a, a high percentage of thumbs up on that. So I think we must've been doing something right in terms of creating this um, uh, nicely paced process. 
Um, <clears throat> so what else did we do? We valued lived experience in order to develop scenarios and, um, and measures that relate to those scenarios. So here are three of our domains, coast and marine health, health and well-being, and education. And th these are three of the, um, the scenarios that we developed early on. Um, so for example, coast and marine health, health, the number of fishing vessels out of Devon's harbors, bottom trawling days per year, the health and well-being, prevalence of access to open-ended, low-cost mental health support, and for education, frequency of moments when young people in Devon experience guided interaction with nature. So I think if, if anyone's familiar with the, uh, with the book, you can probably tell immediately um, the, the difference in the kind of scenarios that we're trying to create, the kinds of measures that we're trying to create. So for example, our measure there for coast and marine health is quite different to ocean acidification um, just quoting from the book here, average um, saturation of aragonite at the ocean surface as a percentage of pre-industrial levels. We just, we just felt that we wanted to create measures that were, um, um, I guess, sort of meaningful and relevant to this place. Um, okay, so... Um, what else did we do? We invited experts to help us test out those measures. So uh, we created what we call twin track measures. And here's a couple of examples from the waste domain, um, one measure for citizens and one for policymakers. And we, we kept, I guess we kept those, um, those measures and our working process in the foreground and the available data, the statistics and so forth, we kind of always, they, we knew they were there, but we kept them in the background. So we were working very much on, on the scenarios, um, examples of scenarios like I've described, but in the background, we knew that there was data like the UK could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 7.4 million tons per annum by keeping, out, by keeping organic waste out of landfills. Um, but we just kept focused on, uh, on you know, what made sense here. So, for example, uh, large scale community composting. I hope that makes sense. Um, so how, what else did we do? We held focus on pathways for action for both citizens and policymakers. So just taking uh, continuing on with the example of waste here. On the left, you've got an example from the Devon Community Composting Network for their idea of large scale uh, community composting. And on the right, we've got something a little bit more um, uh, sort of statistical, which is the UK lorry driver shortage. So um, really the, those, that, that, that level of change as, as indicated on the right hand side, um, is something that I think policymakers could could really take action on, in terms of addressing things that come up like lorry driver shortages. Whereas the community, the citizens, can make progress on um, on actions like the Devon Community Composting Network. I must be doing something wrong here. I keep clicking on the wrong button. Um, so what else did we do? We, we, throughout the process, we tested our assumptions uh, constantly. So uh, what I just described in the previous slide, the twin, the twin track pathways for citizens and policymakers, we checked in with the collective and asked how important do you think it is for citizens and policymakers to work together on making change happen? And you can see uh, the, on the bar chart here that most people felt it was uh, extremely important to, um, uh, to do that. So uh, again, what else did we do? We invited in many ways to try out the Devon Donut, to shape it and evolve it. Um, for example, here, we, we're using the Devon Donut as somewhat of a, a simplified lens. We invited in the Devon Climate Emergency Partners uh, who are, uh, had embarked on a, on a large scale project to increase um, EV charging points across Devon. And this is something that is is happening here in Devon. 
Um, so the collective looked at that project. So we invited, we invited those folks in. Uh, the collective looked at that project from the perspective of each of those domains. And um, you know what you can see here is the the red is kind of not doing so great. The green is 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 good, and the orange is is sort of somewhat neutral or some somewhere in between. So what you can see is air quality and health and well-being were obvious winners um, with regard to EV charging points. Uh, but, but what about equity, equity and equality? You know, not everyone can afford an electric car and therefore have the use of an electric charging point. So maybe, you know, more affordable public electric buses and boats would meet more needs. Um, it's just a way of kind of testing out how well might this project do across, across all of the domains, not just, not just one or two. Um, and then finally, uh, we are um, constantly sort of just looking at, at what's next. So what's next for us? Um, you can see here some results, more results from our survey. Uh, sharing the Devon Donut, um, what are the ways that the collective think we can best do that now, now that we've accomplished the first iteration, assuming it will evolve. Um, we've generated 44 pathway projects from our twin track measures. Uh, that's that's um, 22, 22 for citizens and 22 for policymakers. And we asked whether uh, how willing would you or your organization be in getting involved in one or more of these projects, these new projects? So we've got a good response from that. And uh, we're also looking at a Devon, whoopsie, a Devon um, Donut Summit. And we asked, uh, we're planning a summit. Would you, uh, would you want to um, get involved? And 80% of the collective said, yes, absolutely, thumbs up. So very briefly, I, won't, I don't think I've got time to go through these, but this is, this is a timeline uh, from, the, from the beginning um, uh, at the Regenerate Devon Summit, um, all the way through to where we are now, which is kind of interesting. The Devon Donut meets Future Heritage with RAM, which is our museum here in Exeter, um, and all the, all the various steps in between. Um, and that's that's it. I don't know if I'm about on time. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jane. Absolutely brilliant. A, a, a beautiful way to distill the insights that are arising from your work. And I know from the conversations we've had together and with Isabel as well, just how many rich insights are coming from this work and how uh, the way in which you're holding it. And you mentioned the setting up an enjoyable way of working, mm. how you're creating I would say irresistible ways of working and the, even the, the language coffee and donuts, you know, it's really inviting. And I think that, you know, you're building a, a beautifully sustainable kind of method of, of, of welcoming more and more people. And, and um, just to echo back language, I remember uh, you used when you said, it's like creating the mixture of the donut like you're baking and you're folding in more and more ingredients into that mixture or more and more voices into that, uh, uh, the, the 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 dough that then gets uh, you're going to bake together and and what we try and do with the 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 deal a deal don't economics action lab is create irresistible methods so i think you've you know in terms of inviting people to be a part of creating the devon donut collective i think you're really on to a winner with that so i'm wishing you all the best with the pathways forward that you you have uh, collectively identified so thank you jane uh, we're now going to uh, move uh, up to Birmingham. We're going to hear from Daniel Blyden and Kavita uh, Purahit from Civic Square. Daniel is co-founder and director of design at Civic Square, um, which is an organization focused on creating the conditions, spaces, and platforms for the residents of Ladywell in the heart of Birmingham to participate in action and learning that will enable a transition to a regenerative economy at the neighborhood scale. With a background in visual design for communications, Daniel uses design theory to help organizations and communities create playful spaces and cultures where everyone can participate in decision-making and shaping the world around them. Kavita is a donor economic researcher at Civic Square and is working on building a data portrait of Ladywood. 
Kavita qualified and trained as an environmental process engineer and has worked in environmental processes optimization at Tata Steel Europe, working on an industrial air quality management, waste storage, environmental auditing, energy efficiency, and industrial decarbonization, and is now using these scientific skills to create a neighborhood science program for the residents of Ladywood. I'm really excited to hear all about the methods that Civic Square are using and the way they're approaching inviting uh, residents to become neighborhood scientists. So I'm going to pass over to Daniel and Kavita, who are going to share this next session together to tell you what they've been up to. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Daniel. Nice to be here. Um, I am going to share my screen and between myself and Kavita, we'll share a bit of our story with the donut here in Birmingham. Uh, in the Ladywood neighbourhood kind of area. So I'm going to start off by sharing just a little bit about Civic Square and um, what its vision is. It's all about building civic and social infrastructure for us to transition towards more regenerative futures together. And this, what you see on the screen, is a visualisation that we did very early on onto the type of space that we're trying to create in the neighbourhood. Um, and so... Let's change the slide. Um, there's kind of three kind of layers to the work that we are doing here. Um, as I said, it's a long-term kind of vision. And the first space is like a public, the idea of what is the future of the public square, physical infrastructure for us to get together, make, play, grow, connect. Um, and what is the things that underpin this infrastructure for it to be helping us transition towards more regenerative futures. Um, so the second, the, the, the underpinning layer is uh, Experimental Neighbourhood Economics Lab. Um, and this is where our donut work really sits. Um, it's all about experimenting and testing and exploring what resi resilient and regenerative neighbourhoods um, can look like and how we work um, with partners um, locally and nationally, such as DEAL. And then the final piece is we have been working on how we establish in our neighbourhoods a connected, collaborative kind of ecosystem of participatory everyday experiences. Um, and these, all these layers come together to, 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 to um, support our work in downscaling the donut to a, a neighborhood scale. Um, so we're gonna share just a few, has my slide changed there? So it's just, um, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, we're here. We're going to hone in on a few aspects of how we've been working to downscale the donut and just share some of the thinking and some of the tools, a few tools in, in, in terms of our approach um, and how we ensure that our neighbourhood portrait, the data portrait of Ladywood and the visions and goals for the donut in the neighbourhood are genuinely co-authored by as many people as possible and that it's um, not just conducted in like one or two workshops, but it's done over a long period of time. Um, and some of the conditions that we've created to explore this work in our context are quite particular because of um, the fact that we're building infrastructure for this long term. And so um, it's still all in development and we're sharing today, what we're sharing today is ongoing work in progress in live testing and iteration in our place. Um, so yeah, I'm going to just share like these are me and me and Kavita and our roles and we're just going to show how we how we've been moving our thinking into practice and hopefully there's some ideas and things that you can take into your own context um, so I'm going to pass over to Kavita now and she's going to talk about the neighborhood science program uh, th thank you Daniel um, yeah so basically our uh, neighborhood science program is kind of an iteration and a build on what citizen science has already traditionally been. Um, citizen science is defined as like the practice of public participation and collaboration in scientific research to increase scientific knowledge. Traditionally, this has been very centrally held, the bodies of knowledge that contain this information, deliberate this information and produce findings for us are pretty centralized, their academic bodies, their institutions, and volunteers offer their time, their energy, their labor, and much more with often not a lot in return. There isn't any honoring reciprocity in this rather extractive process. So we have devised this definition of neighborhood science, um, which you can read there. 
Um, we have designed it to be um, anti-exclusionary. This framing allows for people who may not be citizens or people who aren't humans to engage with our collective learning and sense-making. We believe that neighborhood science is one of the ways in which the neighborhood can exercise democracy through activities that center literacy development, um, deep, participati deep participative engagement, imagination, collaborative sense-making, and relationship building. The emphasis on place within this framework is super significant. It allows for us to all um, experiment with the way that the designated neighborhood can be inclusive of all people, regardless of background. It allows for the findings to be attributed to the makeup of the place, not necessarily your academic um, standing. Um, and it is informed by people who are of, of all backgrounds, of um, all species that we can learn from. And through collective sense making and imaginative storytelling, this can allow for more demo demo democratic decision making of the connected and empowered. Um, so, so we have built this framework on three principles. Um, so the first is that it's small scale, as we mentioned before, like the place is super significant for us. We feel that the scale of the neighborhood is crucial in order to build communion amongst people within the neighborhood. People who may be passing through the area, through the neighborhood, have observations that are probably different and equally as valid as people who inhabit that neighborhood over a long period of time. Um, and these insights and these observations can allow for more deep understanding of what that neighborhood is, how it is built, and how it interacts with ourselves. This allows for us to capture the big, the small, the interconnected nature of all the happenings within the neighborhood. Uh, the second pillar is the renegade research. We, um, whilst our research at Civic Square may not directly be affiliated with any academic institution that has historically or institutionalized verified or institutionally verified research and knowledge gathering, our research is still valid and we hope that it offers, it opens up an, a world of science to the curious and the engaged, even though they may be unqualified. This element is fundamental to our people taking up agency within their own habitat. When people are afforded the ability to play, to observe, to learn and shift within their own spaces, we can, afford, we can see two democratizing. Affording people the agency to do just that cannot happen without people actively participating within their habitat. So we invite the curious, unqualified, entangled and proximate to observe, to play and to learn. The peer reviewed element um, of, of this pillar of this work is, is crucial again, because we want to be rewriting a lot of the practices that institutional um, bodies may have had, but there are some key principles to hold dear that, that enable us to have rigorous practices that allow us to have deep understanding of what is happening. Peer reviewing in conjunction with working in the open are fundamental to our collective inclusion. The shift that we see as necessary is in who the peer is. Relate, repairing relationships with peers of different practice and therefore, therefore peer reviewing with relationships bridged to provide deeper and wider understanding of earth systems and social systems upon which we all depend. In ensuring that deep and rigorous review is not compromised, it must become an everyday practice to accept a critique, to remain open to further exploration without withholding or gatekeeping of knowledge and definitely without ego. We understand that this requires many macro and micro shifts in culture, in practice, but it, we believe that it's a crucial element in making decisions and in, in taking information that can pr protect, preserve, and change what the neighborhood needs. In order for this to be intersectional and democratic, um, it's necessary for all the findings to be reviewed of peers of many practices. So it can stand up it, to scrutiny and all of the findings that we establish are credible and reliable. Um, we believe that this kind of way of organizing allows for people to see a truly distributed by design practice that is regenerative as well. It enables an ecosystem that can respond to inform and protect and heal as a collective. So the vision of um, the vision of what we have is really, really vast. It's bold. It's massive. It's to create a decentralized sense of tools that allow for agency to develop through literacy. 
literacy of planetary and social systems enables neighborhood scientists to become active agents of their habitat, to steward and defend the identity and the integrity of their place. The goal is to have neighbor, our neighborhood scientists co-lead areas of research, deliberate over data, and sense make over stories whilst creating artifacts that compound knowledge into wisdoms that can continue to be practiced. We aim to create a space for the neighborhood to co-author and co-own the neighborhood donut portrait. We want for research centers and universities to collaborate with us, to corroborate with us, and to create new complex understandings that provide neighborhood scientists to adapt to all the changes that, of the crises that we face. We envision systems that share the skills and expertise amongst the neighborhood to create an adaptive, anti-fragile ecosystem of defenders that can steward their land. This co-authoring um, and co-owning of the donut picture through direct contribution means that neighborhoods will be able to identify areas that are falling short of meeting people's needs and areas that are overshooting the planetary systems. And this provides a unique opportunity for neighborhoods to identify areas of investment and development needed to create thriving, adaptive, resilient neighborhoods. We're certain that this can be achieved through the foundations of deep interpersonal and participatory relationships that build communion amongst our, our habitats. Um, this vision may be too bold, too idealistic, and too far beyond what our current systems can allow for. But as we can see here, there is clear evidence of outlined, defined, and um, peer-reviewed um, urgent need for serious change that shifts everything that we're used to centering, but we can't afford not to try. We believe at Civic Square that our role is to create the conditions to, to explore and create and emerge new possibilities of knowing and understanding. So far, we've started creating the tools to socialize the social systems and planetary boundary, boundaries that we all live by and their intrinsic connections and interdependencies. We've done this through a number of ways, primarily through rituals and co-creative practices that are central to Civic Square's ethos and that build the trust through deep relationships that provide the honesty, depth and rigor to our learnings. And Daniel will be able to talk us through all of these. Thanks, Kavita. Um, um, yeah, so I just wanted to share, building on from what Kavita shared, like how we're kind of putting these things into practice. Um, and this is where we started, obviously, with unrolling the donut. Um, and as Kavita just stated, uh, the interconnections between the social systems and the planetary systems that we all live by, um, it, uh, raising literacy around these um, two kind of strands of the donut is where we've kind of started from. And we have a suite of extra um what we call everyday extraordinary consistent rituals rhythms invitations that happen in the neighborhood in our everyday life and we we host these um as an ongoing um consistent kind of like staple to the neighborhood life and create these as spaces where we can get people sort of engaged in the ideas of the donut and 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 kind of conduct the research and so I just did this little we have this kind of like model and approach that we've taken and we have the everyday activity that I just mentioned about and then we have moments where we invite people into the co-creation of the donor and the kind of authorship and continual um, moments of convergence of what we've learned so far so that the data and the knowledge is shared and, and owned by not just ourselves but by the neighborhood um, and so I said that on the one side where we have our, our everyday activity, um, there's kind of ethnographic style research approaches that um, bring up lots of qualitative data. And then on the other side, there's lots of desk research and, and, and looking at the data, bigger picture. Um, and then these are all fed into ongoing moments of convergence and bringing that together. Um, in co-creative moments. So we have these co-creation weeks and we are at the point where we are about to do co-creation week four, which we'll tell you a little bit more about later. Um, and this, the, 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 the end goal is to actually um, bring together a neighborhood portrait um, of the donut and how we move towards that. So we started off with big, uh, with opening in co-creation week to our studio days where we had neighbors come in and respond to the bigger questions of the, the four lenses and moving forward it 
we started to, well, we are working towards tagging them to our everyday activities. So for example, Room to Grow is a regular weekly active, um, participation space that we have where people are connected to plants and soil and thinking about their imaginations around how we kind of see and imagine our local ecological domain. So things like how we are going to build and protect our soil, um, increase biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can imagine these are happening regularly and we tag the domains to these and learn about what people are really saying and then connect that back to the, the data and the desk research that we do. Another example of this is the Neighbourhood Cutch Club, which is a film space, intergeneral space, where we show films that are related to the various different domains that are in the donut and um, talk about these with neighbours. So then we're asking the question, how, how do we learn from people's perspectives or how they even interpret some of these issues? And then another example is our ongoing after school club that we run. And it's a weekly offer um, to two local primary schools at the moment and working with children to get their perspectives around the donut on a regular basis too, and tacking it to all the different domains in, in the donut, in, in the um, kind of four lenses. Um, we have been hosting workshops and these are much more, um, more about bringing people on various walks in the neighborhood and getting them to observe and take this canvas with them and ask them questions about what they observe about the various, the four lenses of the donut and um, capturing different um, people's perspectives through that. And uh, this very much tags to uh, the neighborhood science participation that Kavita talked about also. Um, and just kind of moving forward quick because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, we do, sorry, my, my computer has a bit of a lag. The, we also design using uh, kind of gamification techniques. So um, how we incentivize and engage people in participation is through like designing games. And um, we have these, uh, what we call the mega quest. The mega quest was uh, designed as a way for people to get involved in, in the neighborhood science activity. And we actually designed these different badges that people could collect through well, mainly children and families in half term when we ran co-creation week was to kind of collect these different badges through 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 working on um, different quests that we set that were related to neighborhood science so you can see the different names that we've given to the different titles and um i'll quickly run through some of the different um challenges and kind of quests that we'd set and we took this language of quests because we we recognized that um this is not yet about exper experimentation, but more about the literacy that we create in people that people are able to create around science and the planetary boundaries and the systems. Um, so I'm just flicking through the different um, quests that we designed. So you can kind of see some are focused around soil, some are focused around water. Um, and focused around energy and keeping an insulation. And so, so yeah, we have all these uh, different quests that we, we, we intend to share and make open source with different um, groups who might want to collaborate. And then just to say, there was also a digital way of engaging with this as well. Um, we used a tool called Goose Chase, which is a scavenger hunt app and in the neighborhood, we set a lot of different tasks that were related to the neighborhood science work and people form teams who would complete these tasks and, and be on a leaderboard. And again, it's just another great way of engaging um, people in, the, in participating in the neighborhood science. Um, and these are just a few images of how it may look on a daily when people are, when the children and young people are getting involved in neighborhood science and so yeah that is just where i'm going to leave it to give you a bit of an overview but to, to, to just share a little bit about what's next um so we're going into the fourth co-creation week which is really around 
responding to the IPCC report and uh, again, continuing with this neighborhood science, but also framing it as like we are really responding to the climate crisis that has, has been framed in the in the report. And then following on from that, we'll be having a regenerative neighborhoods festival, which is really a two week um, moment where we'll be really connecting the, the, the data, the rich data research with the everyday participation much more so and then moving towards the neighborhood donut compass launch and 27th to 29th of October in 2022. Um, yeah, so that brings us to the end of our presentation. And my, oh, Imi's just messaged me and we might, I've got a little mistake on this, um, this slide. It's actually July, the festival, not June. So just to make a note of that, if you're writing the dates down. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions or comments, just email myself or Kavita. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Daniel, Kavita. That's just the most amazing. Um, and, and it's just such a rich uh, selection of, 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 of insights and, 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 and approaches and the mixture of the conceptual with the practical. It's, it's, um, I know from, from having visited Civic Square just uh, how much is going on there? So to be able to distill just some of that into to these presentations was a was a feat in itself. Um, so thank you so much, and just loving some of the lines you you were coming up with there, the curious and unqualified. Um, I think I'll take that away, um, and just the the nature of creating the rituals, rhythms, and invitations so that everyone can, you know, be part of the uh, the process, to co-author and co co-own um the the sort of the the the, the portrait that you're creating um, there are a few practical questions that were coming through maybe if we just ask a, a, a couple of those now so i mean how big is the neighborhood that you're working with um and so what's the sort of partition uh, participation like for for something uh, like the workshop which is the coolest name for a workshop ever by the way how big is the neighborhood? Um, we think about it in different scales. So we've tried to transcend our sort of ward boundaries and um, political boundaries and postcodes by talking about what's walkable within five, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and how we serve that. And we are refining this, but there's many facets to like um, what we consider to be the neighborhood. Sometimes we do have to operate within the, the domains that are set up on maps with the, um, with, the with postcodes and, and, and and, and ward boundaries and so forth. Um, when we're really doing that data research and looking at digging into those pictures, but when we're working with people, we're talking about um, what's walkable, what's what's within um, uh, where they're living or working. And so we don't exclude in that way, the boundaries are sort of porous. Fantastic. Yeah, when I was up for one of your co-creation weeks, one of the answers to the question is, what do you, do you feel is your neighbourhood? Someone said, if I can, the people who could hear that bell toll, and it just all of a sudden casts a complete different perspective. And you kind of, you see all of these different answers laid out on uh, one of your uh, your sort of workshop tables, and you, you, you recognise all of the perspectives on a, maybe a question that you've just assumed um you know you have your own thought and definition but until you ask that question and invite people in that kind of way you know you might not see all the, the diverse perspectives of, of what a, of an answer might be to that question so there are quite a few um questions that are coming through in the chat and we're recording those and we've got time to answer them later uh when we've got a, a q a session um but we're now going to move uh, to our final speaker um and it's it's wonderful to invite barbara goffin who works for uh, confluence um, an organization that has for the past few years been uh, coordinating the Brussels Donut, a project financed by the Brussels Capital Region uh, that has used participatory methods to co-create a shared compass um, for uh, the people of the region to use. Barbara has a, a varied background ranging, uh, ranging from the private sector to the NGO sector with more than 10 years at Fairtrade Belgium. And, Having recently joined Confluence, Barbara is now adding a new string to her bow by diving into the delicious adventure of the donut in Brussels. So I will pass over to Barbara. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this um, create an amazingly interesting uh, session. Um, so I don't know if you all can see my screen. 
screen now. Um, I guess uh, I guess you can. Um, so um, yes, my name is uh, Barbara. I started uh, indeed in February uh, at uh, Confluence, and I have uh, the honor to uh, continue the amazing work that has been done uh, in Brussels on the Brussels Donut Project. Um, for those who are not fami familiar to, um, <laughs> to Belgium and to Brussels, uh, the region um, of the capital of uh, Brussels is one of the three regions in, in Belgium and it's composed on uh, uh, 19 municipalities. Uh, so here, the idea of, of downscaling the donor to to Brussels is supported by um, uh, the cabinet of uh, Barbara Tracht, who is uh, the regional secretary of state for the economic transition. So um, uh, we have had a first phase of the of the project uh, started in September um, uh, 2020, uh, and that that um, stopped in in May 21, uh, and that was financed by the um, the region of of Brussels. And, that, and now we are starting a new phase uh, of the donut um, since February this year. Uh, and we are again financed by uh, the, the region of Brussels, as well as uh, financed by a private foundation, uh, Porticus. So that's great because then we can uh, have a two year um, project and we hope to have uh, uh, now uh, continuous financing so that um, we can continue our uh, experience exploratory work uh, with the donuts. But the conclusion of the first phase was uh, very positive. Uh, it was a success. So uh, we are happy to continue, um, continue the project. Uh, we have yeah, two main missions in our project. Um, first, work on the borders of the donut. Uh, so work on the indicators of the uh, ecological ceiling and the social foundation. And uh, this is something that we do in partnership with uh, the ISHEC uh, Business School. Um, and I will go more in detail uh, on that afterwards. And then Con Confluence is really working on um, uh, inside the donut. Uh, so on the activities that can um, that can help public administration and uh, private companies to enter into uh, the donuts. And of course, uh, the deal is uh, an important uh, partner as well. And uh, we are happy to uh, collaborate with, uh, with the deal and, and, and uh, yeah, when, when, when it is uh, necessary. Um, and our approach at Confluence for uh, this uh, second phase will, uh, will well, we are really uh, willing to go into action now. Uh, the first phase was uh, a bit testing the different methodological tool that, that are uh, possible with the donut. Um, and now, uh, well, we will uh, still do a big sensibilization work on a broader public uh, from public administration and private sector, and then try identify some uh, actors, some stakeholders willing to go with us uh, a bit further on um, testing the tools, uh, organize workshops uh, on the four lenses to um, get them start going into action. And then uh, with an um, uh, even closer selection of, um, of actors who will uh, really have a, a long-term process uh, of the appropriation of the tool um, by the team themselves so that they can uh, use it uh, for uh, their decision-making process. So um, yeah, the Brussels Donut Project has uh, had a quite uh, innovative way of, of, um, of working on those four different uh, layers. Uh, it's it's uh, actually um, yeah, four complementary approaches to have really a holistic a holistic way of working with the donut. Um, so the, the first uh, layer, the macro uh, layer, is uh, really doing the portrait. Um, the aim um, is indeed to 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 have the donut as a as a compass for future uh, decision making uh, process, um, and to see how is Brussels performing today uh, on all those indicators, and where do we aim uh, to go uh, in the in the future. So um, this is the first um, the first results that we had after our uh, ten month uh, project. 
um, as you see, well, there is a big watch out because it's, of course, um, very um, simplified version of, of the donut. And you also see that there are still uh, gaps, so uh, missing data and missing statistics on some, some dimensions uh, that we will have to work on and, and complete. Uh, to have a fuller view of, uh, of the work that has been done here, you see it um, uh, based on the four lenses. Um, and here you see also that, uh, yes, the, the local um, social and environmental uh, is, of course, more complete than the, the global social and environmental. And that's also something we uh, also still need to work on to, um, to improve. Uh, this work has, has been done on a participatory approach um, with uh, citizen and with the different um, experts. So uh, we will continue that work for uh, the next uh, two years to have a, a more complete um, portrait. The second uh, layer is uh, the meso layer is uh, really for um, uh, to analyze um, public policy strategies. Uh, well, that's an important layer because um, public administrations and uh, political uh, representatives play an important role to help the society enter into the donut. Uh, it really gives an enabling uh, environment that is necessary. And uh, here we see that uh, the appropriation of the tool can really help to uh, either evaluate the effect of a strategy or to help um, uh, in the decision-making uh, process or even to uh, help build um, new networks. And uh, here as an example, and well, what, what's going um, to be very important for this uh, second phase of the project is um, the new publication of um, the regional strategy for economic transition um, uh, in Brussels. So the name is Shifting Economy. Um, and it's a very ambitious uh, strategy that has been um, uh, recently adopted um, that is tackling a lot of uh, different thematics uh, such as sustainable food, construction, uh, waste management, mobility, uh, health and um, cultural industry. Uh, and the, the region will provide um, support to reorient um, uh, financial instruments to, um, to encourage companies to operate the, the changes necessary for that economic uh, transition. Um, the, the bad news is that actually uh, the, the name Donut was taken out of that strategy because of political, um, uh, political constraints. Uh, however, um, when reading the strategy, it is actually completely in line with uh, the vision of progress that, uh, uh, that is promoted by the donut. And, and we believe that public administrations um, uh, will uh, continue to use the donut uh, in order to help them roll out that, that strategy. So, um, and the, the, the long-term objective of that strategy is to uh, achieve to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Then the third uh, layer is the, the, the micro level. That's where we analyze uh, concrete situation, concrete projects, um, and try to see uh, the, the potentials uh, or, the, um, or the bottlenecks that uh, an ecological and social transition can, can mean. So during the first phase of the project, we already uh, had a chance to um, analyze three uh, situations, uh, Mazui, Arc-en-Ciel, and uh, Delva. Um, all of them already active um, in the transition. Uh, so um, the first, Mazui, is about the renovation um, of, a, of a future social artistic production place and uh, where uh, the, the, the key of what they were doing is really work on circularity, so reuse of the material uh, and work in, in co-creation. Uh, Arc-en-Ciel is a collective housing project in a passive housing uh, according to the community land trust uh, model. And uh, the third delva is uh, the construction of um, a construction site um, with circular ambitions. Um, all three uh, projects were really at the end of the of their project when the donut workshops um, entered, and it was really a moment for the team to evaluate uh, what they have done and how can 
um, did they have gaps in their uh, way of doing uh, according to the to the four lenses. Um, but I'm happy to, to share with you that we have now also a new project that uh, has uh, come up to us, which is the renovation of a European building. And here we are um, at the early phase of, of the project. It will be a 10 year project. Um, and um, the aim is for them is to have an um, exemplary building by 2030. So uh, we are very happy to be able to um, um, accompany them, um, them with the with the donuts and uh, with several workshops in order to help them in their uh, decision making process. So this was the, the methodology that was used um, during the first phase of the project. So um, uh, usually it was one to three uh, different workshops to 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 do all that uh, but it was uh, mainly three big steps that that were uh, explored so first doing a donut express um, with the 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 people with the team on the situation then uh, work on the four lenses and then identify new objectives um, and then with those new objectives, work on the sign board in order to see how can uh, their activity be more regenerative and uh, distributive. And then the last, um, the last uh, layer uh, is the nano uh, level, and that's uh, really the analysis of um, concrete products. Um, and yeah, we have analyzed the, the smartphone as being uh, one of our obvious day-to-day uh, -day, uh, product that we all use. Um, and the idea here, the methodology was to uh, cross-check the life cycle uh, analysis uh, of a project with the four lenses uh, in order to see uh, the, the, the impact of the production process and the consumption uh, choices. That's a very, actually a very powerful um, educational tool to um, to make it more concrete for people to understand um, um, the donut and also to um, raise awareness on the uh, impact that consumer behavior uh, have on uh, social and environmental um, impact. So this is a visualization of, um, of that uh, smartphone analysis uh, with the four lenses. Um, and all the material that I show you here is uh, is um, has is publicly available on on the Donut Brussels uh, website. Um, yes, and here it's <clears throat> indeed so. Those four layers uh, was actually uh, really meant to uh, first create a methodological um, uh, guide for for all people willing to uh, work with the donut. Um, to to learn from what we have done, so that um, yeah, more people could could uh, could be involved, and also create a, a community of people, um, yeah, willing to uh, appropriate the tool. Um, so yes, I think I'm at the end of my presentations. I have been I think <laughs> shorter than fifteen minutes, but uh, yes, thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Barbara. And for adding that perspective, when we start to engage with uh, the policymakers, the strategy creators at the regional scale, sort of recognizing that we can actually start bumping up against those political tensions of, 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 of what is the mindset at play? How does, how does the word donut land with them? You know, is it actually a case of recognizing donut can be behind the scenes, this kind of thinking, these tools for action can actually still be really peddling away whilst we might recognize the uh, a vision of well-being or something like that and understanding that there's space for all of these ideas together and they can all play their respective roles so thank you so much for sharing that and all of the the, the, the perspectives from the macro down to the down to the nano i think it's a brilliant way to show that um the ideas of donor economics offer a frame for applying to different scales uh in in, in different ways as well so thank you so much for bringing uh, for all the speakers for bringing these different perspectives and what it means uh, to, to bring these ideas of donor economics to, to, to communities, whether you're networking across a region like Devon, whether you're applying the ideas in the daily rituals of a neighborhood, or whether you're thinking big and strategically across a region and understanding how you can uh, influence up um, those, uh, the ideas um, to policymakers and politicians.
And I just want to share uh, now, just reflecting uh, on where we, what we've heard, that um, you might be thinking, okay, how can I take these ideas forward myself into the neighborhoods, into the districts, into the, and even to the streets where you are? And um, I'm going to share in the chat now a, a set of new tools that we have uh, launched um, based on the inspir inspiring practice that we've seen over the last two years that are called Donut Unrolled. And uh, both um, Barbara and, and, and I think Daniel mentioned it as well, this um, approach to unrolling the donut to create a local perspective on the global challenge of the donut. So if the global goal is to meet the needs of all within the means of the living planet, how can our places contribute to that challenge? How can we help bring humanity into the donut? And so identifying our local aspirations alongside our global responsibilities creates a space to hold all of the richness of the conversation of what it might mean to do that within the social foundation and the ecological ceiling. So I invite you to have a look at the visuals that we've got in uh, that launch article that I've just shared in the chat and the tools that are available to apply these ideas uh, to your place. So that brings uh, to a conclusion the the sort of the the, the, the um, presentation we've heard today and so we get a chance now to reflect uh, on what we've heard come up with some questions and we'll go into a Rob, can uh, I just do session. one thing first and I'm sorry I'm going to pass to other Rob <laughs> to um to also introduce the uh the short survey uh we're going to have a, a a short reflection from the speakers today um and so if we have Jane Daniel Kavita and Barbara, um, I hope you're all back. Um, what we're going to do now is if, if uh, I'm going to invite you, maybe starting with a short reflection from each of you, what you uh, heard from the other presenters that either spoke to the work you do or you found particularly inspiring. So I'm um, going to start with um, the same order. So um, Jane, if, any, any reflections or anything else you'd like to, to share? Uh... Yeah, fantastic. I mean, so, so inspiring uh, to see what um, other folks are achieving. And what I what I realize is um, how how kind of obsessive um, the the Devon Donut Collective is around um, actually trying to figure out the operating system of the donut. Um, and you know, when we when we first began, we we talked about it in terms of planning, making, and sharing. And so much of, of our focus has been on the planning and the making of some kind of a a, a diagram, a donut that that um, that made sense to us in terms of how to connect the findings and the data to the red and the green. Um, and uh, I'm just really inspired and excited now to sort of move more into the the, the sharing that, that was described up in up in Birmingham. Um, you know, all of the all of the sort of uh, tangential activity and the um, getting people involved in the in the bigger concept of the donut. Um, so I'm super inspired about that. And just to point out, I did, I did see a, a, com, a question in the in the chat asking about our work and, and how it was funded. And I just want to say that it was totally unfunded. So for, for a year, we we all worked on this um, with no funding whatsoever. So the other thing I'm inspired about is just to see with the Brussels donut that um, that there has been some funding. There is some funding to to really uh, to to help co-create the Brussels donut. So um, that gives that gives me hope. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Um, Kavita, would you like to um, reflect on behalf of um, Civic Square? I know Daniel's just had to, to, to hop off, but um, any reflections from, from what you've heard today? Thank you so much. Yeah, um, there was a there was like two things that I, I thought were really significant. I really enjoyed hearing um, from Jane uh, about how Devin was continuously corroborating and like checking everything and and critique self-critiquing to make sure that there was a lot of integrity with how 
their portrait was built and their process was um, could stand up um, against the wider, like how it has to stand up in, in these spaces to, to provide for integrity when we have such an emergent new model that um, is, is pioneering spaces. Um, and and from from Brussels, I I was just like, wow, this the, the level of scaling that happens here, it's great because you have like a, almost like a Russian doll of donuts, um, and that is really incredible because we did a um, a practice in January when we had our team retreat where we all did our personal donuts, and you know that even allows you to engage with the concept in a different way and. And to see that this can be a collective thing, it can be a personal thing, you can apply it to businesses, you can apply it to individual products. And to see that done within the scale of like how a, a city, how like we can imagine even beyond that um, was, was really excellent. So um, those, are, those are reflections that I have taken on board. Thank you, Kavita. I love that idea of the Russian donut. Uh idea russian doll donuts um and you mentioned the personal donuts and um uh i'm going to share us in the the, the 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 chat where you can read about that and you can actually get the canvas that you've used and this is a story that civic square has written on the donut economics platform and so just like other places just like confluence just like um devon donut collective sharing stories of practice and the tools that you're developing along the way um, so to finally move to uh, Barbara, any reflections for, from what you heard from the others? Well, it was um, uh, great to to be here because uh, I'm also new in the in the in the movement. So it was amazing to to hear all what's happening uh, at different scales and at different levels, and 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 so many people involved to um, to to work in in Devon and 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 for Civic Square, so a lot of energy and uh, yeah, nice to see the the bottom up movement um, compared to maybe or maybe more top top down approach. Um, and and it's funny you you talked about the uh, Russian doll, Kavida, because I was going to say the same thinking. Well, one of our approach that we wanted to explore was to see how can we even downscale our regional approach to the municipality and then yeah ideally neighborhood etc uh but uh, yeah that would be again uh, yeah big big work so i don't know if we have the staff and the <laughs> capacity to do it for the, the this phase but uh i really like this um, this idea of downscaling even more and then i will also uh, retain the workshop i found it also uh, great and i hope we'll be able to uh, to do some workshop uh in in brussels as well yeah Wonderful, thank you. So we're going to move to some of your questions that you've been asking now, and and one that um, immediately got uh, a, a lot of other likes um, was from Moza Jacobs, um, and uh, it was wondering how to apply the donut thinking to remote and scattered communities. Um, so. Actually, I think that might also have come from Jackie Ferguson. Apologies if I didn't yeah, get that. We, we, were, we were together in the same room. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, yeah. So, do you want to add a bit of? Um, do you want to speak to that question yourself, and then and then speak as if you want to reflect on on that too? So, Moza, do you want to add anything to that? Well, yeah. Well, I think it mainly came from from Jackie because she's on the island of Lewis, and I'm in West Cork, which is we're a regional network in a in a rural area, of and so that those are different. Um, Different situations than if you're in in a small or in a in a compact neighborhood or if you have a city, and I think it's also a bit different from Devon. I'm not sure because I think there the the government is really or the some part of the government is really involved. Whereas here we we have to work with the government, but that's difficult with the local authorities. So um, I I don't know. Um, yeah, I think it's it it the but. Any rural area, of course, contains numbers of neighborhoods. So while, while the, the presentations were going on, which were very good, I was thinking about, you know, you could look at, at, at the neighborhood. You could pick a neighborhood everywhere. I'm not answering my own question, but I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's one of the things. But maybe yeah, Jackie no, also no. has something to say about that because she's from a different situation. Yeah, but I was I mean, thinking really that much along the same lines you know we're scattered small tiny communities and you know where do we start you know because you're not going to get 
people involved from the same area. You, you have to bring in people from a wider area because we're, we're such a small uh, remote population. So where to start and, and how, to, how to start, basically? Yeah, do you have any reflection on that? Me? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, you know, Devon, um, uh, Devon has uh, some dense uh, urban areas, but it also has some um, much less populated areas. And I guess it's, it's for us, it was kind of a, a question of timing, because as it turned out, we began our process uh, sort of right around the lockdown time. And so we persisted through the two lockdowns and therefore all of our process was online, um, which meant that uh, people could participate from wherever they were. And uh, we did have people who, um, who are from local government, from councils, uh, you know, school teachers, um, I mean, just all kinds of people who are who are par participating. Um, we don't have specific uh, support from the local government. This is here in Devon. It's pretty it's very much been a grassroots citizen led um, process, although, you know, the folks that, that joined our sessions, um, they kind of were representing themselves as individuals, I would guess, um, rather than sort of representing the organization that they worked for. And so that that led to much, much more kind of open discussion and uh, transparency, which was great. So um, I think, you know, as we move forward, um, the idea of actually sort of physically being out in the world with people and, and um, visiting various, various communities will become much more of a, a challenge. But our, our sort of MO really was by working with network nodes, as we call them, each of those nodes has a network and by creating tools, um, by being very transparent on our website, we explain how we've done everything. Um, we're also hoping that, that communities will, will kind of uh, step up themselves and want to embark on a process much like ours or um, a similar process. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my, those are my reflections on that question. Thanks, thanks, Jane. That's, that's um, a question which um, I think a lot of people in the community are, 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 are juggling with. And uh, an Emmy um, Kaur, who's joining us from uh, the, the team at Civic Square as well, posted something in the chat. And Emmy, do you want to just talk to this, the learning communities that you've got, which have her walking with that question as well? Yeah, so we've been really thank you, um, uh, Robin. Uh, we, we've got a we've got a, a global program where we were bringing together peers who wanted to unpack the book from a home street neighbourhood um, perspective. They're halfway through. Um, you can find out more on the link that I shared, and there will be a public showcase and other things in the in the coming months. Um, and they've been unpacking it from lots of different perspectives. Um, whether that's uh, rural Scotland or I can see Safi here from Wolverhampton to uh, Monica, I think who's in is is in um, one of the groups to uh, international neighborhoods. And what they've been doing is coming together and allowing themselves to have that space in that that void of, of really being in the book and doing a chapter two and really looking at all of those layers. So we'll be sharing those tools soon and then they're going to start to move their inquiries and learning questions into into practice um and i guess that practice question is is the big scary one for, for everybody like where do we start what's a neighborhood what's the street well where do where do i go with this like i don't have all of the the governments on my side or i don't have the local council or i don't have uh, a scientist or i don't have a researcher and i guess for us especially in those years where we were um, more unfunded and figuring out how to go about this advice would always, always, always be start where you are. Um, start with the skills, the assets, the passion, the anger, the peers that you have um, around you, whether that's in a work setting in your household, on your street um, and on your neighbourhood. Um, 
uh, scale. And I guess with those people who are across those cohorts, they are exploring it from lots and lots of different um, perspectives. So Julia Higginbotham, who's in rural Scotland, and we can connect um, people there. Um, and I guess that's where Rob and the Deal platform is, is again, a really powerful one. But really starting from where you are, um, from a, from an asset and from a what are the challenges here, I would really recommend is is the is the right place because it allows you to just deep into what the abundance that is within you, within your peers, the drivers that are there, and then you can start to stack that up with other peers, with tools, with inspiration. You know, um, I always say at Civic Square, I hope the way we've done it is like almost the worst way it could have been done because everybody will just take those tools hack them make them better make them more contextually relevant um and so yeah a lot of those tools and how to do a deep dive chapter two alongside a lot of the work that deal have done around how to run a book club will also be in the tools that we um share but starting where you are i think is a, a really important principle with this because you can quickly become incredibly overwhelmed but then once you're in there, it's almost insatiable. As you can tell, our ambition has just grown and grown and grown. Um, and so I think allow yourself to, 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 to take those steps together. And the great thing I think that is really interesting about what's been happening with us at a neighborhood scale is that, you know, if you look at the street and you look at the neighborhood, it happens that people on the streets and in the neighborhoods turn up as neighbors, but also our counselors, our scientists, our civil servants, our mothers, our aunts, uncles, and you start to get this beautiful intersection between, you know, um, how you show up in your place and all these skills that start to emerge and bring their own um, story to it. We're learning that in the team as well. Since 2018, it was a few of us. And now people like Gavita, who are incredible um, uh, uh, talents and skills are coming and they're taking it to whole new, um, whole new levels. And I think if you, then allow that to grow and proliferate the skills and connections will come from all over the place as well. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm going to uh, now move on to the topic of, of approaching uh, and speaking with municipal authorities around this, this topic. Uh, we had a question from uh, Philippa, uh, which was um, initially directed at Barbara, but um, anyone to, uh, welcome to respond, which is how did the municipal authority get involved in the project? And it sort of relates to some of the other themes coming through about, um, uh, which includes the question um, around attitudes. How do we change deep attitudes uh, which impact on our uh, uh, on and govern our activity? Um, and that was from Alexander Price. So, um, Barbara, um, I'm interested to hear um, how uh, the municipal government became receptive to these, these ideas um, and uh, the actions that you were able to take to, to help that along. Uh, well, I think, um, yeah, I was not there at the beginning of the process, so it's not easy to answer to that question, but um, the, the, um, the cabinet of Barbara Trecht, which is active on the economic transition, um, is, is really the one that are supportive on, on the tool and, and that have enabled us to, to, to get the funding. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a great opportunity indeed to have that political uh, support. Um, but on the other hand, as, as, as I said in the presentation, it also had a, um, uh, a bad side because then we, we now have a very green um, uh, perception uh, of, of the donut uh, uh, because she's uh, she's from the ecological party and, and so uh, it is giving us some um, um, barriers to to uh, to go further uh, convince other polit political parties to uh, uh, to the donut because they, they perceive it as a, a green uh, tool so um, so on the one hand, it's 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 um, yeah, it's very important to have that political support, and on the other hand, there is a risk. Um, so that's why also I think it's very important to to work on all those layers and all those different actors, and and also with the private sector, etc. So in order to um, depoliticize, I don't know if you say that in. <laughs> In English, um, the 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 donut, and and in order to make it uh, carried by, uh, yeah, broader uh, public. 
Thank you, Barbara. And uh, and also I'm interested in, in um, the approach the Devon Donut Collective has taken with um, council members being a part of the collective. Jane, do you want to just briefly speak to that and how the, the one question came through is, you know, how d has the council come on board? And so do, are you able to offer any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I would say I would say so we have uh, Devon County Council and then we have local to us uh, district councils. And um, interestingly, uh, we've had probably more interest from East and North Devon um, in terms of councillors participating than we have in South Devon, for whatever reason. Um, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I think the, the councillors who participated really appreciated the neutral space in which to, um, uh, they didn't. They didn't feel as though they were. They were being put on the spot. They were part of the conversation, part of this, the discussion, part of the solution. Um, I, I think I've got a, a memory of hearing that uh, Cornwall Council. I know Cornwall's not Devon, but Cornwall Council were, and Rob, you probably know more about this than I do. They were a little reticent about taking up anything with the word donut in it, and so they have the. Um, the decision wheel, right? The decision wheel, which is kind of based on based on the donut. Um, but so so far, uh, even though there has been interest, there are participants from from the councils. There's there's uh, you know um, co collaboration to a certain degree. It's not something that the um, that the council is is taking up, and probably because somewhere in there there is the sense of not wanting to take up a particular methodology. Um, maybe that's part of the, the rationale um, for the councils not adopting, you know, our, our approach. I don't know, what do you think about that, Rob? Well, I think the, um, the it's, it's interesting how uh, it can get associated with politi certain political parties. And I think what we've noticed uh, working quite well is recognizing that it doesn't have to always be used under the banner of donor economics. Donor economics draws upon wisdom that existed before. So, you know, the idea of complexity economics, feminist economics, behavioral economics, you know, ecological economics, these are the, the diversity of, of um, ideas and practices that come together that Kate Rayworth sort of wrote the book to, to allow these ideas to dance on the same page together. But but ultimately, we, you know, we, we we can you know we can call out this challenge that you know um, things are, are broken certain from a from a social perspective and an, an ecological perspective. How we can bring these two things together to think more holistically, and then once you're on board with that, donut economics can offer some tools towards that action. So so I think if if the donut's not landing, you know, there are you know, many other pathways, and it can always act in the background. I think that's what we're what we're seeing. Um, I've got time for, for probably um, uh, one more question. And, and I'd like to um, invite Kavita to reflect on, on a question that sort of came through from uh, Michael. Um, and it was actually relating to um, the, the Devon uh, collective 44 points of action. Uh, and it's sort of very difficult to know how much of these actions need to happen before you're inside the donut. And that's a really interesting question. So when you define these local measures, how do you know when you're actually moving into that safe and just space? And so from a, so Kavita, thinking about the sort of the, the sort of neighborhood science uh, uh, aspect of things, have you got any thoughts about the thresholds and when you might move um, from maybe a place of harm actually moving into the space of a donut? Yeah, I think that's a it's a really interesting, complex question that's got a really multifaceted answer. Um, but I, I just want to also reframe that, like part of the donut, the the sorry, the neighborhood science program is also to allow the neighbors to be able to to the the people within the neighborhood to be able to be involved in that decision making process of like what are these metrics and where do we de define these thresholds, and that is really about like having the ownership held by the neighborhood itself. And in that decision-making process and defining process, I think that's where we can start to identify where those limitations and where those crossovers can start to happen. And the wider vision is also that we'll establish one, our, our, our current picture of where the, where the neighborhood sits. And then over time, we'll be able to map and see 
what the changes are um, with our neighborhood scientists actively participating in the, the, the data gathering of these changes over time. So it will be, we're envisioning it to be like a, a long-term project that is collaborative throughout and will be able to be monitored by the neighborhood scientists throughout as well. I'm not sure if that, I think, does that answer the full question? Well, I think there's no definite answer to this. And I think we're working this out together. Yeah. And, and something we try to offer um, with the four lens methodology that uh, I was sharing before yeah. um, of the unrolled donut is to say, we have planetary boundaries at the global scale. So what does it mean for our neighborhoods to thrive? And we don't have boundaries as defined by Earth system sciences. So what can we learn from the genius of nature in our most wild habitats nearby and finding those and understanding the cycles of the um, of, of, of life to, to sort of mimic that and, and set up the conditions for regeneration because um, as Janine Benis, the biomimicry thinker says is life creates conditions for more life and so if you're starting on that journey to create those conditions then the regenerative process can begin to kick in. Um, so uh, I think that sort of uh, wraps up what we're able to, um, to to cover in terms of the questions now. But uh, the, what's so wonderful tonight has been that we've been able to, or wherever you're joining from, whatever time of day it is, is that we brought together three different perspectives on community action with donor economics. Um, we've heard uh, from, from Jane and the sort of what it means to sort of network across a whole uh, region to bring people together into the conversation. We heard from Daniel and Kavita who are, taking part in the experiments at the very uh, uh, granular level from household to street to neighborhood to empower agency and, and literacy in all the neighbors to be a part of this question and co-create, co-author their own portrait, their place to move into the donut. And we heard from Barbara, who has thought at all different scales, from macro strategic scale for a, um, a, a region of Brussels, all the way down to the nano scale and analyzing the impact of your phone. And then understanding what does it mean to take a report and then carry it beyond the first electoral cycle forward and sort of what does it mean to kind of reshape the sort of the, the naming and the narrative around that. And so it's great to reflect then on the way which everyone who's presented tonight can be inspired by the others too. And so the donor economics platform, donoreconomics.org, is a place for you to read the stories of other people. And then as you take action to inspire your, add your own stories to inspire others too. So very much in, invite you to, to check out that website and uh, to, to look at the tools and stories for action, including how to apply the tools to your place, but also the tools to apply to education as well. I know there was a question in there about um, how we influence a curricula, and there are lots of people exploring that too. So if you're interested in applying these ideas to your context, there is someone there it, it, working, walking with that challenge too, could be the other corner of the world. So um, thank you for uh, for joining us and listening to these conversations. I'm going to hand now back to uh, Rob, who's going to guide us um, through the the last the last few things. But the very exciting reveal, which I think, uh, I, well, I'm certainly looking forward to. Uh, but I'll hand to Rob for for what that is. Thank you, Rob. So so much. Wow, what a, what a, an extraordinary evening. Um, one thing we'd love to do now, just before we move into some housekeeping and we see what Fanny's been creating, is just to get a snapshot of how this was for you. How has this session been? How are you feeling after being immersed in the world of donut economics for the last hour and a half? If you could just use the chat, just two or three adjectives, two or three words that sum up how you're feeling now after this beautiful evening that Rob and Jane uh, and Kavita and Daniel and Barbara have, have offered us here this evening. Where are you, how are you feeling with that now? Um, uh, overwhelmed, inspired and thoughtful, tantalized, it's a nice way to be left feeling at the end of an evening, hope, connection, encouraged, inspired and a bit overwhelmed, love extraordinary every day, learned a lot, revitalized, inspired and energized, Hopeful that this can become a, this might be a story that can depoliticize the decarbonization process. Inspired, overwhelmed, ambitious. I 
Thank you, everybody, so much. And uh, as, as Rob said, there are many, many tools available through the Donut Economics Action Lab that can help you do this where you are. Pete says it's daunting, encouraged, and hopeful. So, um, uh, 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 yes, so all of the sessions that we're offering tonight and over the next eight or nine days are offered free of charge, and we're delighted to do so. But if you felt that you found something really valuable, in this session any donations are much appreciated there's a donate link that goes in the chat now and if you feel inspired to, to chip in please do thank you so much and don't forget that our online space vive is a fantastic place to continue any discussions that have started here and to share any outcomes or or learnings from this and other sessions and we'll be posting a link uh, from this session there uh, including the how to get there and the result of the early earlier Mentimeter poll will go in there as well. So the link for where you can join up to that is there as well. Tomorrow is going to be an amazing day at the summit. It's our first full day. So there's still time to clear your diary of everything else that you had planned to do tomorrow. Between 10 and 11.30, our very own Chris McCarthy and Rhiannon Osborne will be hosting an unmissable workshop on Together We Can Do Kick-Ass Social Media, a vital activist tool. Then between 12 and 1.30, if you enjoyed our blizzard of stories last night, and if you missed it, the video I think is now uh, up online, and maybe someone could put a link to that as well. The and you enjoyed the story of Zero Guildford, Ben McCallum will be doing a deep dive into how they created that climate center on the high street uh, with other voices too, a masterclass. And then between four and six is a session that promises to be incredible. Susan Raffo and Stacey K. Haynes presenting Together We Can Create a New Relationship to Trauma. They were guests on my podcast and they blew everyone away. Really don't miss that one. And then the crown of tomorrow night is again at this time, seven till nine, together we can build more inclusive movements. An evening with four incredible guests, Sherry Mitchell, Sid Yang, Amina Awais, and Gupreet Singh. And the link to what event details and for people to book that session is in the chat. Please share it far and wide. See what I mean? How could you, how could you miss any of that uh, at all? Uh, we're also at the end of the sessions asking people to take a couple of minutes to fill out our feedback form, our session feedback form, which is just going in the chat now. It's really helpful to us uh, if you could do that and, um, and do tag us on social media. So, which brings us to Fanny, who has been drawing away, creating a beautiful visual record of uh, this evening's workshop. So, Fanny, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Rob. It's coming. We need, um, we need more extended drum roll. <laughs> okay. Whoa. Um, so I will show you the, the replay of the, so you can see a bit of the process of the drawing. Thank you. That was so inspiring. So inspiring to hear from, from people around the world who are putting donut economics into practice with different perspectives, from a networking perspective first to a neighborhood perspective, all bringing people to make the mixture of the donuts together. Diverse group of people, whatever the backgrounds, qualified, unqualified, one common goal, meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. I let you have a look.
Thank you so much. And I will see you uh, with the next session with some more drawings. I hope you like it. And we will be sharing other drawings on social media. Thanks a lot. Annie, thank you so, so much as ever. So, so this will go on all our social media and on the Vive platform. So uh, do join us as often as you like during the next eight days. I just would like to give an enormous heartfelt thanks to Rob for, for pulling this session together and to Barbara, to Kavita, to Daniel, to Jane for bringing their experience, their, uh, their hard-earned insights and learning. And to all of you for coming along this evening. I hope you found this really useful. And uh, we're just going to unmute everybody's microphone so that you can thank them yourself. And we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks so Excellent. much, Rob. See ya. Bye-bye. See you, everybody. Thank Bye, you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.